If Arnold Schwarzenegger was in The Nun 2. No, stay away, damn you. I'm going to send you to hell where you belong. Hi guys, so the other night I went to see The Nun 2 at the cinema and I was really looking forward to this because I am one of the very, very few fans in the world of the original Nun. I think a lot of people who went to see that film didn't really get it. They maybe had unrealistic expectations of the whole thing. This villain, Valak, she first popped up in The Conjuring 2 for about five minutes and it was absolutely terrifying, the little sequence that she was in. And I kind of feel like a lot of people were expecting the full length nun film to be just like that for like an hour and a half, just Valak, Valak, Valak being really terrifying, like some kind of insane non-stop roller coaster ride. But in reality, it was never going to be like that. The, the proper conventions of filmmaking would have to kick in. It, there, there would have to be some story and character development. Valak was never going to be able to pop out every five minutes. And what we got was almost like an old school gothic horror film that was more about the atmosphere than, than, than scares and kills or anything like that. So I just feel like modern audiences weren't really in the right frame of mind to properly appreciate it. I do feel like the first Nun film, though, when rewatched, will become a lot better if, if, if people would give it a chance. But for anybody who didn't like the first film, the story of number two isn't really going to appease them because it is kind of more of the same, but in a more urban environment. So this time around, Valak has taken control of uh, the character of Frenchie from the first movie and guided by Valak, Frenchie is going all over Europe looking for some kind of relic that Valak needs to become even stronger. I'm not going to talk about the, the specifics of that relic because I'm trying to avoid spoilers today because it is a new movie. One or two things might slip out of my mouth that you're not meant to know, but I'll try and keep those to an absolute minimum, not spoil too much for you. But ultimately, Frenchie ends up at this boarding school in France that used to be a monastery. And this is where Valak's uh, intercontinental reign of terror ends because the relic is beneath this place. In the meantime, Sister Irene uh, from the first movie, she is hired by the Vatican to go and find Valak because... Valak has been leaving a trail of bodies all over Europe as, as Frenchie has been heading towards uh, France and the Vatican quite correctly deduce that uh, Valak is behind it all. So they get Irene to try and reproduce her miracle of the first film and sort it all out for them. One thing I didn't expect from the story, uh, so coming into this, I expected that Irene would just be sent straight to the boarding school and then the movie would spend all of its time at the boarding school kind of a thing. A bit similar to the first film where she's just sent to the monastery and, and off we go. But no, actually the Vatican do not know where Valak is at the start of this, even though we, the viewer, do. So for the first half of this film, Irene is having to go round from place to place with her new friend, investigate the clues, piece things together, speak to people, examine a few crime scenes and things. And the, it, it's got a li little bit of a kind of Da Vinci Code feel to it, especially with the whole architecture of France and... I kind of liked that approach to this film. Um, it's just kind of cool. And then the second half, we get into a little bit of a faster paced situation where Irene and her friend arrive at the monastery and, and you know, the battle is joined kind of a thing and, and the pace really picks up. Michael Chaves directs this film. He didn't do the first one, but he did do a couple of other films in this universe. He did the the Curse of La Laruña, a very underrated film for me, and also The Conjuring 3. I think this guy gets a little bit of a bad rap from people who commentate on these movies. I think sometimes people elevate James Wan's reputation a, a little bit too much, as if he's some kind of deity of horror. He is very, very good. I, I like him a lot, but there's a reason why he doesn't come back and do more Conjuring films. Well, there's probably more than one reason, but one of the reasons is that it would just be bloody hard for Wan to come back and replicate the success of the first two Conjuring films. You know, there's only so many times you can make lightning strike in your favour when it comes to this kind of thing. And just as people talk up one a little bit too much at times, I also think that they talk down on Michael Chaves a bit. You know, his films in this series are not the most popular ones, but I, I think they're bloody good films. The studio are clearly happy with this guy. They keep bringing him back again and again. Uh, financially, the films are very, very successful. And given the fact that this series is now on its ninth film, I think Chaves 
is doing a very good job of producing some really great content at a time when people are bound to have a little bit of fatigue with the whole thing. I must say, I really enjoyed this film. I vividly remember being sat in my cinema seat about halfway through this and just taking a moment to think to myself, this is so awesome. This is exactly what I wanted this sequel to be. Uh, there are so many good scare scenes dotted throughout this, two in particular that I remember. Uh, so there's one involving a kid in a bell tower where Valak is somehow at both ends. And there's also a scene with a magazine rack, which you might have seen in the trailer, but the full length version in the movie is just a different animal. It's absolutely brilliant. The characterization is very strong in this film. The story unravels in a very satisfying way. The only downside to the whole thing, I'd say, is possibly the last 10, 15 minutes. And I had a similar feeling at the end of the first Nun film. That the first Nun film is, is no masterpiece by any stretch. I, I think it's a very good film, but it's not without its flaws. And the biggest among those is the ending. It's just a little bit too boom, bang, a bang, a bit too much CGI and fire and brimstone and close-up shots of Valak. There's just a little bit too much on the screen. It doesn't quite fit with the slow atmospheric build-up of, of the, the film up to that point. And the second film kind of does the same thing. And it really, it just brought it home to me by the time I was done with this, just how risk-averse the people behind these films are. You can sort of understand it because The Nun 2 is part of this big cinematic universe. Uh, they've, they've been making tons of money with each film up to this point and they don't want to stray too far from the formula that's working. And so they make these films in a certain way. They, they don't want to try and go all original and, and do something that's going to leave, leave your jaw hanging off because they totally haven't done that with any of the films up to this point. They're following a certain pattern, they're following a certain formula, and this wild ending that they seem to put in at, at the end of a lot of these films now, which is never the strongest part of any Conjuring film, it does seem to be a little bit of a staple. And I, I do think they're trying to appeal to all types of people who would, who would go and watch this movie, especially the casual cinema goer who will just come out of one of these and the first thing they're going to talk about is the ending, because that's the last thing they saw. And if it was wild and full of stuff happening, that, that they're more likely to speak of the film positively, maybe. But I watched The Woman in Black the other day. I might do a review of that film next, actually. Uh, not a dissimilar film. Period piece horror film. Somebody's going around investigating stuff. There's a supernatural entity behind the whole thing. But that was a British horror film made by Hammer. And you can just tell that they're, they're more happy to just tell a natural story, not worry about making 500 million at the box office, that there are kids who die in that film. There's a downbeat ending which feels very arty, there's not a lot happening. Complete contrast to The Nun 2, uh, where they are very conscious about the bottom line and not screwing anything up in terms of the future viability of, of maybe more sequels or spin-offs, you know. In this film, and I'm going into spoilers now, just for this one moment, so if you don't want any spoilers at all, then turn away now. In this film, they are completely against killing any kids. Now, bear in mind that this is a boarding school and there are child characters. They really seemingly did not want to kill any kids in this film. And I, and I think this is all part of that whole process of, OK, let's try and make a scary film like The Country, but let's not also do anything that's going to grab headlines in a negative way. But at least twice in this film, kids should have died, really. At least two instances where it actually didn't make any sense for, for certain kids to not die. So that's something which is slightly disappointing, I guess. And I, if I name even one more reason why the film is, is pandering to that casual cinema goer, it's in the early stages. There are a couple of kills towards the beginning of this. Now... I don't remember the first film having kills in the early stages. It, it was quite happy to just develop the story and let the film build naturally. But at the start of this film, we get a couple of kills, one of which I will admit, OK, okay is maybe necessary for the, for the narrative. But the second kill, I, I don't think was required at all. It's just a complete throwaway character who dies. But I think this is part of the process of just drawing people in to begin with, because this is a 110 minute movie and, and people weren't bowled over by it the first time, then maybe there was a, a, a sort of ploy in place to just sort of think about the people who aren't the die-hard Conjuring fans, I suppose. I can't let this review pass without mentioning Tessa Farmiga, who plays Sister Irene. 
I've been a big fan of this actress for quite a long time. I can't remember if I first saw her in American Horror Story or a horror film called The Final Girls. I can't remember what came first, the chicken or the egg, but it was one of those. I distinctly remember, though, thinking to myself when she was hired for the first Nun movie, oh, that's a good signing. I approve. And I was right to think that because she was really good in the first film. And I think she's possibly even better in this one. And just remember, this character that she's playing, Sister Irene, very, very restricted in terms of what you can do with her. She's not the most marketable final girl, shall we say. Because she's a nun, she can't show any flesh. She can't have any relationship. She can't have a love life. This isn't somebody who's going to flip around like Alice in Resident Evil, you know, driving motorbikes through church windows and stuff. But despite that, Taysa Farmy does really well with the character. She really makes us like this person. She's just got a really natural charm, I think, when she's playing a role and the various nuanced little choices that she makes throughout this film in particular, I think very, very smart. Like whenever... Irene has to show some warmth or she gets the chance to smile. Farmiga takes full advantage of that. She lets her face light up. At the other end of the spectrum, when, whenever she has to get angry or upset about something, she doesn't overdo it. She doesn't see it as an opportunity to, to burst out of the nun's habit and make, make the character really dramatic. Like the scene where she gets told she has to go and hunt for Valak, for example. So she could have got really upset in this scene and started banging her fists down on the table like uh, like Ripley and Alien saying she didn't want to go back to LV-57 and that's the end of it. But she doesn't. She just calmly sort of says, no, not going. You know, she she, she keeps it fairly moderate. She, she trusts herself. She trusts that her natural instincts as an actress will uh, show her the right way. She has faith that this, uh, that, that her... Her natural way of um, acting will, will be enough for this character, and it is, because she's a very likeable actress, and I just really like this character, I've got to say. It just goes to show that we can have all sorts of different types of final girls in horror films. We can have nuns, we can have disabled women, we can have women of different ethnicities, different ages. I mean, look at uh, Vera Farmiga, still the lead character of the main Conjuring films, and she must be in her late 40s at least, I reckon, the woman from Insidious, uh, is it Elise, 70-odd, like the main girl of, of some of those films. By contrast to uh, what we get with Sister Irene, I was watching Texas Chainsaw, the beginning. I, I saw it the night before I went to watch The Nun. And the two main women in that film, one of them, her, her introduction in the movie was basically... She pops up in a bedroom. She's only wearing a bra. Boobs are literally bouncing all over the place. And then she turns around and jumps on the bed to have a bit of kink with her boyfriend. That's how they decided to introduce that that main girl. Sexy time. You know, that was what that was. They, they thought that would be a great way to introduce that character. And, and honestly, I can't even remember anything about that girl from the rest of the movie. Aside from the fact that she gets her throat slit about five minutes from the end. Obviously, Texas Chainsaw as a franchise, not quite as sophisticated as, as The Conjuring, but still. When it comes to Irene's uh, co-stars in this film, so Irene gets a bestie call, uh, I can't remember her name, but she's played by Storm Reid. When she's in this film initially, I, I thought that she, she had a certain charm, this actress as well, and she was going to be really good for the movie, but she's not actually in it that much. Uh, they have a, a long chat on a, on a train as they're heading towards France and, and you think at that point that these two are going to be working together quite closely as, as they solve uh, the mystery of Valak but I, I can't remember this character actually assisting all that much as the movie goes on. We get the return of Frenchie of course from the first movie and he's very good. I actually liked him more in this one than I, I think I did the first film but curiously the, the middle-aged guy from the first movie doesn't come back in this one and it's revealed that he actually died of cholera between the first and the second movie. And I've, I found that kind of sad because he was such a good character in the first movie. Although the more I've thought about it since then, I, I guess it's, it's OK that they didn't bring back everybody from the first movie. Because when that happens, sometimes you can get that you can get that uh, the gangs all back together type feel. And they're all a bit smug in each other's company, mentioning old times where they managed to, you know, defeat a villain or whatever. And it, it just gets a little bit too friendly and 
safe, look at it, use Scream 6, you know. So maybe the fact that we've only got two of the, the three characters from the first movie back isn't, isn't such a bad thing. And Irene and Frenchie don't actually get that much screen time together. But nevertheless, the middle-aged priest, whose name has completely escaped me, I, I liked him so much in the first movie, I, I would have at least liked him to come back for maybe like one scene in this, maybe a cameo, have Irene just go and seek him out for help like halfway through this film there is there is a moment where irene has to go to a library in france and and get talking to this expert on 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 the occult or valak or whatever and maybe they could have made that the uh, the character from the first movie but they don't I, I don't know if the actor didn't want to come back or maybe they just didn't want to hire him but certainly they, they just dismiss him from this universe with a with a quick offhand comment about how he died of cholera Normally at this point of the review, I would show you a physical copy of the film I'm reviewing, but obviously The Nun 2 has just come out in cinemas. There are no DVDs or Blu-rays available for this yet. I did see advertised a very nifty looking Blu-ray steel book for The Nun 2 that's about £30 or something. It looks very good. I'll probably end up getting a more vanilla copy, but I'll certainly be buying the movie. I, I really enjoyed it and I've, I've got a lot of these films already. Right, let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out how I'm going to score this. So we've got one, two, three, four Bloody Axes out of five. An excellent movie. I really enjoyed it. It's been a long, long time since I reviewed the first Nun film. At least a couple of years, I reckon. Maybe slightly longer. And I think when I reviewed it on the channel, I only gave it three out of five, but that was my first viewing. And I've seen it a couple more times over the last couple of years. And now I would say the first movie is also a four out of five. So just ignore the old review a little bit uh, if you're tempted to check it out. I, I would give both of these Nun movies four out of five. I'm a big fan of them. I'm a big fan of the Conjuring universe in general. If this is the last time that we are to see Valak, I think uh, th this character, this villain, has a very good pair of films. And I guess there's nothing left to say today other than the fact that I am really looking forward to the fourth and, and final Conjuring film when it comes out. Um, I, I suspect it will probably be a couple of years from now rather than a year from now, but, but we'll see. Right, thank you for joining me. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.